Okay, good morning, everybody. This is week 31 of ENM 2020. We are in the home stretch, which is to say we're coming around to the, the last few weeks of the course. Uh, and this week's talks were an interesting set of talks about what we could call the abundant center hypothesis. Um, I want to start the question and answer session by just giving a real short clarification because I could see in the questions that things weren't 100% clear. But essentially, there's an old hypothesis, old meaning decades old, <coughs> which posited that that species would show the greatest abundance in the center of their geographic distributions. So we could call that the abundant geographic center hypothesis. Um, and that idea was, was interesting in its time. It saw a lot of empirical attention, a lot of tests. And basically it saw very, very uh, scattered and incomplete empirical support. Now a newer idea, which was, was begun by Enrique, who's with us today, uh, was what we could call the abundant niche center hypothesis. And that was the idea that um, if one could characterize the fundamental niche of a species, that the sets of conditions right there in the middle, right at the center, the core of that fundamental niche, would show higher population abundances than populations that are out at the edge of the niche. Now, there have been a bunch of uh, papers written and opinions expressed, and there's increasing controversy about this. Um, I can distill it down and say that um, there's a bunch of papers from Enrique's group, of which I've been a part of a couple, uh, that have shown empirical support for this relationship. And then there's a bunch of papers um, from another group or groups, um, the names associated would be uh, Santini and Dallas, uh, that have purported to show lack of support. Um, and then there are some, some other unassociated papers that that are more variable in whether they show support or non-support for the relationship. So um, what's really going on? I think we need to discuss this stuff. We need to uh, analyze, we need to test. But I would suggest kind of looking forward into the future, uh, there are three different questions that are crucial. One is whether in truth, in reality, a relationship exists. Second is whether we've got the right set of methods that can characterize that relationship. And third is whether the data we're using are sufficient, are of sufficient quality and precision that one can detect the relationship if it exists and if the methods are, are correct and sufficient. And I think sometimes, well, many times, arguments are made in which one of those three conditions is not fulfilled. And yet, the argument or the conclusion of the argument is that the relationship doesn't exist. And so uh, I'll refer you to a, a debate that's about to be published in the journal Biodiversity Informatics. Uh, that'll have three or four papers that take on this question. Uh, you can see all sorts of debate in, in papers by uh, Luis Osorio and Enrique and, and and uh, a couple others. Um, Jorge and I have been in on those debates. Um, 
you'll see on the other side papers by Dallas and Santini and others. But I really would encourage you strongly to make the difference between the fundamental question of whether a relationship exists between niche centrality and abundance versus whether the methods are right or the data is right. And I'll, I'll, I'm not going to say too much. Right? I, I might say too much if I get started later on. But I'm very frustrated that a lot of the negative opinions about this relationship have based their analyses on data which are known to be, based on opinions in the literature, known to be noise. Okay, the data that are known to be extremely noisy and extremely imprecise. And a data set like that is not the way to disprove the fundamental question of whether a relationship exists. Okay, so that's, that's an opinion expressed out of some frustration. Because, you know, I could say, the sky is blue. And Mona might say, no, the sky is green. But then I could turn and look out the window, close my eyes and say, no, the sky is blue. But maybe she's right and the sky is green. Where do I get off closing my eyes and, and arguing against Mona's proposition? An outrageous yeah. proposition. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the sky is green. I'm in Chicago. The sky is gray. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's just my kind of overarching commentary. And it's born out of a little bit of frustration with a a literature that I think is not giving full fairness to an interesting idea. And Enrique is, is a witness, I think Jorge as well, that I argued pretty strenuously against this idea. I thought it was a dumb idea. I told Enrique not to I proceed thought that with well, it when he was still my student. I thought and, the same. I always told Enrique, this is a shitty idea, don't do both. Yeah, please, please don't, don't waste your time on this. And then, you know, with, with a partial data set a very early on, maybe not the right methods, Enrique showed that the abundant niche center hypothesis has a lot more explanatory power than the abundant geographic center hypothesis. And then more recently, using really good quality data, in a paper led by Luis Osorio, we found pretty serious um, support for this hypothesis. And again, most or all of the negative opinions about this hypothesis have been based on data that are extremely noisy, if not simply put, garbage. Sorry to say it. I know, Jorge. I said the word garbage. It's better to say yeah, garbage than the word shit, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. I have to mute you, Town. You can't mute me. I'm the host of this meeting. Okay. What do you guys think? You want to go to questions? You have any opinions, any comments in general? I would like to make a, a comment. Um, the thing with the geographic abundant center hypothesis is that it is mostly based on data and with no theory behind. There is one theoretical paper that I have found. It took me a lot of time to find it. And it's a very, very obscure journal. Uh, and when you read, the, 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 there are two hypotheses there to explain this uh, um, geographic abundance center hypothesis and the two hypotheses are just rephrasing of the of the fact they are circular uh, one is based on ideas van der Waart and birch and basically they say well the, the the suitability of the area decreases from the center to the periphery well if, if it's 
if the suitability decreases and you are measuring suitability by abundance, then you are just being circular. So it's in, uh, data or partial data with no theory. With the niche is different because for that one, there is a strong theoretical argument that there should be there. So that's a big difference. And then it comes to actually check the theory and then you see that there are plenty of, well, factors that, that would uh, uh, hide the, th the theoretical argument behind. But one ha doesn't have any theory and the other does have theory. And, and I, I think that makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, remember everybody all the way back to one of Jorge's very first lectures in this course, where he basically defined the limits of the Grinnellian niche as where populations stop replacing themselves. So demographic processes should be right at their limit, at the limits of the, of the fundamental niche. Now, what is the structure inside that niche? There are some reasons to think that there could be a, a structure within the niche. So yeah, that's an interesting point that the, the geographic center hypothesis really depends on uh, a certain structure of environment related to range, which occasionally is fulfilled and many times is not. Often it is not, yeah. I'm going to share with you the, the reference to that theoretical paper. Okay, I'll, I'll put it in the course materials. People I'll also will have put to, to science well, up to get it. In both cases, in the geographic center and niche center hypothesis, there are uh, some conditions in which you would expect that both or one of them hold and when it, it wouldn't hold in, in both cases. So uh, what, what I like about all this uh, topic and even the the debate is that we are learning a lot about theory and we are using theory to understand what is what is going on most of the papers that have been published on this topic they are looking for a relationship between methods different methods with uh, the, the it, it's the 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 output of the methods the suitability scores or probabilities of presence or whatever with uh, abundance. And well, it, it's, that's the same case as with the geographic uh, center hypothesis. It's, it's just to try to find a, re a, a correlation without asking why is this correlation and why some methods work better than others. And there are clear examples in the literature in which they compare several methods and some of them work and others don't. And nobody has asked why some work and why others, even that they, the, the score they, they get, they have no relationship with abundance or, or among them, which is even worse. What, what means that we don't exactly know what those scores reflect I think that comes back to what I was trying to to express is, which is is there a relationship is the question that ought to interest interest us as biologists and then getting the methods right and getting the data right is kind of a separate question yeah and for me as an empirical scientist, what I notice is that if you analyze shitty data, you find no relationship. And if you analyze high quality data, you find a relationship. And so that really suggests to me that that data sufficiency question or even method sufficiency questions should be considered separately from whether there is a relationship. Yep. 
I just want to like comment before starting the answers that like some of the arguments that are out there like against this uh, hypothesis are, are related to the very low correlation or that the correlation is not linearly tested uh, or stuff like that. But uh, I just want to make a, a reminder for everybody that we have seen a during this course, all the complications that we face when we're doing these kind of studies, all the complications and biases that we have in data, and all things that can happen because of accessibility and like lacking sampling and stuff like that. And imagine, like, even though we have all of that, we can see that relationship and we can see a signal. I think that is valuable. And at least at that scale, uh, it's interesting to see. It's telling us something about uh, a community, a more population level process. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, remember back to when we were talking about Wallisian species, you know, those species whose distributions are structured by dispersal barriers and not by uh, environmental uh, conditions getting to a survivability limit. Well, a Wallacean species, you're not going to see, nor are you going to be able to characterize those relationships. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Marlon, you know, all these different, um, all these different factors that we've treated in 31 weeks of this course, they all come into play here, and it's pretty easy to set yourself up to not find a relationship, even if the relationship exists. Yeah, Jorge. You can also see things from the other perspective. The fact that you see the relation when you have the good data, it's a good argument in favor that the niche has a structure because that's what predicts the relationship. So it's, it's, uh, it's also an interesting sort of different point of view. It's not that the data shows that the relationship is true, but the data supports the idea that the niche has a structure because that's what is uh, in the core of the, of, of the idea. Well, but uh, there are many things that we need to understand uh, regarding data, both uh, biological data and uh, environmental data to understand this relationship and, uh, and how the species interact with the environment. And abundance may be a, an, an expression of fitness, but may, may not for some species. Yeah. It wouldn't work because abundance is not the, the, the right parameter to measure. In reality, this is not a matter of, of abundance and, and the structure of the niche. It's a matter of fitness and, and the structure of the niche. Mm -hmm. When abundance reflects fitness, you would expect a relationship if you are using the right environmental variables and if the relationship between uh, the species with the environmental variables tend to be Gaussian, uh, belt shaped, and if if the noise produced by, by dispersal, the Ali effect, or other uh, demographic uh, happenstances <coughs> uh, are lower than the, than the signal, as as Marlon says. So there are many, the a lot. See, so, yeah, m many details or many, m many elements that we need to, to consider when we are uh, thinking on these ideas and to, to understand our data, if our data is reflecting all this or not. It's more... It's you are just, muted, Peterson. Peterson, you are muted. God bless. That's very true. Um, do we want to do some actual questions? Yeah, let's go for questions. Okay. I'm going to 
to share my screen. And here are some questions. Um, let's, let's start with some basic definitions. At the end of the questions, there was one, please, what is the Ali effect? And here at the beginning, there is uh, what is a sink population. Uh, Orke, you want to give two quick definitions? Yes, sure. Uh, sink populations are populations that have numbers, individuals, but negative growth rates, and they are sustained by immigration. This is an idea that was developed by Ron Pulliam in 1980 something, 1986, if I remember well, in a paper that is pretty famous, and uh, the word is the, the name is Pulliam with two L's, Ron Pulliam. And he designed, defined source populations, which are those that have positive growth rates and send migrants elsewhere, and sink populations, which are populations where you see the individuals, but the population growth rate is negative, and, and the numbers are sustained by immigration. Those, that's a sink. And um, the kind of data we see in GBIF, you don't distinguish between sinks and sources. You just see populations with with numbers of animals. <clears throat> and let's go back to the BAM diagram. The BAM diagram can show sink populations because those are the populations that are within M, but outside of A or outside of A intersect B. Okay, which is to say they're places where dispersal takes you but the conditions are not completely correct, either abiotically or biotically, the conditions are not completely correct for the species to maintain populations. That is sink and source populations. Now, Ali effects. Uh, the, the name comes from an ecologist of the 1940s, uh, Dr. Ali, and the idea is that you may have um, positive density dependent effects at very low densities. And the most obvious is if you are a sexual species, there is no way one individual is going to establish um, a population. You need at least one male and one female. And presumably more than that, a lot of species are social, a lot of species do things in groups, a lot of species do, for instance, um, uh, uh, work against predators by 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 traveling in groups and, uh, and and using warning calls for the entire group and things like that. So an alley effect is a threshold of minimum population size that you need to start a viable population. Below that number, the population won't start. It's an important concept in ecology, in population ecology, and um, it it's one of the reasons why you by modeling dispersal, you need to model also to take into account whether there is an alley effect or not. If you are dispersing, but populations won't start unless there are at least 10 or 30 of your, of your species, then it's not just one migratory event, it's the aggregate of migratory events. It's an important concept. Yeah, essentially, the alley effect trims very sparse populations out of out of the species distribution, or if you're doing simulations or models, it would essentially trim those really um, extreme marginal conditions from being within the species distribution. It's, it's a low density effect. Okay, um, I picked out one question that I think is a good one. How can we know if a species is in distributional equilibrium to be able to test the niche abundance hypothesis? Good, Good question. question. Yeah. <clears throat> Certainly, there, there are some ways to know when it's not going to be in, in um, distributional equilibrium. Don't do this with a, a recent invading species. Don't do this with a species that is present under changing conditions, okay? Don't do it with conifers near the, 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 the northern pole. Because of warming climates? Uh, things like that. You mentioned the important ones. Yep. Um, 
distributional equilibrium is a is a tough question to address. You can do kind of approximations to it by looking at the set of conditions that your model um, identifies as suitable for a species and then comparing that set of places that fulfill those conditions and asking whether there are occurrence points across all of the major kind of biogeographic areas that are suitable. And that are accessible. Uh, well, that's what I was just about to say. Distributional equilibrium is scale dependent. If I say at the level of the universe, there may be a planet several galaxies away that presents exactly those conditions. But as far as we know, with very minor exceptions like the moon, Earth's life has never been off of Earth. And so it's outside of the M for whatever species you could be interested in. But by the same token, it could be a species with a native distribution in Africa and you know those those non inhabited suitable conditions might be in Australia. But if we limit our universe to Africa, that same species might be in distributional equilibrium. So it's it's a it's something that is a a function of the scope of our analysis in geographic terms. Another question of, of interest to anybody. Okay. Another for Enrique. Yeah, let me pick some from, from me. This is the first one that I see here is, um, I have a doubt, for example, in the case of Jaguar, when this kind of abundance modeling is performed, is the size of territorial per individual considered? Well, this is because I presented an example by uh, Natalia Torres. She's a, she was a student of Denise Filo. And uh, what she did was collected uh, density estimations of jaguars across the, the, the whole continent. And most of them were made uh, with uh, camera trapping. So explicitly is not, but implicitly it is because they estimate numbers of jaguars uh, per 100 square kilometer. And uh, based on, on the sampling with, with the cameras, they, they put cameras two or three kilometers apart from each other. So they don't know exactly the size of the territory with these methods, but they take into consideration how many times the same Jaguar appears in different cameras. So it, somehow it does. Okay, I don't know if someone wants to pick another one. I have another one for, for me. Go ahead. It says, uh, it's line 2876. Suitable okay. habitat estimates where we usually use the average value of environmental variables. Example, Chelsea uses average from 79 to 2013 and occurrence data. In this context, uh, how an analysis of abundance versus suitability can include the variation of the abundance in relation to specific environmental conditions at specific years that might be different from the average values? Or is, it correct, or is it correct to assume that these specific environmental conditions won't affect the overall result significantly? Oh, this is an interesting question. Really, really good question. Yeah. Uh, this is, I think, a big problem in terms of most of the abundance data available because we, we, we have very punctual in time and space some abundance measure uh, in, in, in most studies, but there are databases like the Breeding Bird Survey that you, you can see the variation of abundance uh, over time. 
So you would see years with high abundance, low abundance, and then you can, you can average those, that information to match also your, your temporal uh, environmental variable. But most of the time, you will have one value in time. So those are the limitations of, of data. And I think uh, that it also depends on what type of, of uh, species you are working with. Because if we work with, with annual species, for example, with grasses or something that it's annual, you would see a lot of variation over, over the, the years as opposed to species that have longer uh, periods of, 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 of life cycles. For example, trees, you go and count trees that may stand there for, for I don't know, decades or even centuries. So I think uh, there is not a specific answer for, for this. It's contextual in terms, in terms of the species that you are looking at and uh, the type of abundance data that you get from them. I don't know if you guys have a different opinion on this. So I, I'll suggest strongly that people tune in to Kate Ingenloff's talk um, near the end of the course, where she's going to talk about time-specific ecological niche modeling. Uh, but I'll also just show you this graphic, which is just something I made out of curiosity. And yes, I know it's in Excel, and that's like low class and low prestige. But uh, yeah, I think yeah. you'll, yeah, I'm that's so sorry, Jorge. <laughs> I'm 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 kind of ashamed of myself. I'm Nonetheless, biased. check this out. This is using. Um, we don't see it. Huh? You don't see it? Yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yes, it's there. Oh, it's I an think. Excel graph. Yeah, it's pretty offensive. <laughs> um, but this is a graph of daily precipitation against average temperature. And you see this one uh, rhomb in the middle that is the yearly average value. And so that's akin to bio one versus bio 12. Mm -hmm. Now you see these yellow circles and you can see they go from here to here and from zero to, I don't know, 10 in precipitation, daily precipitation. Those are monthly values. And then these gray circles are daily values. Okay, so here's the really interesting uh, outcome of this. And this, this co goes back to uh, Narayani Barve's dissertation, which taught me huge lessons of just how to think of this. If we're talking about a mosquito, that mosquito might carry out its whole life history, maybe in these two months, where there's enough water around and it's not too cold. And so that's a species with an extremely responsive life history. But one of Enrique's trees, which stay in the same place for a century, those trees see all of this variation as just part of the stuff they put up with over the course of a small part of their lives. And if you think about in the middle, well, any species has to find a way to deal with any species at this place. I forgot to tell you, this is one spot. I think it was Lawrence, Kansas. Um, any species in Lawrence, Kansas has to find a way of dealing with these extreme low temperatures and these extreme low precipitation values and these zeros for precipitation, days where there's no precipitation, and days where it's really hot. You know, if I have any year besides 2020, my solution is to be in the Southern Hemisphere on the days when Lawrence, Kansas has temperatures above about 25 degrees, because 
Kansas is kind of miserable in the summer. But it's a really interesting thing to think about how time specific are our physiological responses. If you put me at a temperature of 200, de 200 degrees centigrade for a minute, I'm dead. If you put me at a temperature of negative 10, I can probably deal with it. But I can't survive at negative 10 for a week without house and fossil fuels and things like that. So we have to think about the time dependence, the time scale dependence of every species that we think about modeling. And for some species, yearly average data are fine. And for other species, yearly average data are perfectly wrong and horrible. So you kind of have to match the temporal scale and the temporal resolution of your environmental data to the natural history of your species. I like that graph, even if it's made in Excel. <laughs> it is good. And, and like the interesting thing about this graph is that, well, and the things you said is that we, we should probably think in not only use bioclimatic layers, because some people can say, okay, then I'm going to use the warmest month because this species likes uh, the warm temperatures or the wettest month or the mean of the warmest quarter or stuff like that. Probably you can start, you should start thinking about what are the right months for the species in all the places. If it's a species that is across a large, like, uh, number of latitudinal degrees from the northern part to the southern part, then it's opposite in these two uh, hemispheres. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to do your own variables probably. And I think right now there is enough information to start doing that. Uh, there are sources of information that give you a monthly data at least, and then you can start exploring, making your own variables and like making data fit the question that you're asking. That is the most important part. And, and also making your data layers reflect what may be known about the physiology of the species. Now, maybe you have a species that has no desiccation resistance. And so you might want to create a data layer of, you know, longest drought period over X number of years. You know, is it two days or is it two months? And that may be the critical variable that either allows your species to survive or doesn't. Whereas an average value doesn't matter. Average value of precipitation like this could have a standard deviation around it that's minimal or that's huge. And so you can't see those, those uh, extremes. Be sure to catch Kate's um, talk later in the course because what she does is she develops um, a way of analyzing and fitting niches where we define an occurrence not just in latitude and longitude, but in latitude, longitude, and time. And then every single occurrence is accorded environmental values not based on its position only, but its position and the timing of the position. I think that's great. Another question? Uh, there is one question, question 2907. 2907, give me one second. By using an ellipsoid niche model, are we assuming that the response curve of a species to an environmental variable is a Gaussian curve? And the answer is yes. Indeed, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian level curves are ellipsoids. 
Um, and we know from the data that at least for some variables, the, um, the response will not be symmetrical Gaussian, but um, asymmetrical with one tail um, falling down in a more sharper way than the other tail. So uh, this is a complication that we have in mind for the next round of making our lives miserable and difficult and complicated. Eventually we will have to leave Gaussian and ellipsoidal models and do asymmetric models where one side of the niche, for instance, think temperature. It is a very well established fact that it's not the same thing to die of cold than to die of hot weather. And the tolerance to extremely high temperatures, it's much sharper, sharply defined that the tolerance to cold temperatures. That is an empirical fact, well established. Well, that means that the distribution is not Gaussian, but is sort of asymmetrical. And therefore, an ellipse is just an approximation. But that's the way we do, we move by approximations. An ellipse is way better than some very complicated form that's multimodal, right? Because that doesn't look like a fundamental ecological niche at all. Exactly. We have good fundamental reasons, biological reasons to believe that the niches, the fundamental niches probably are convex in the sense that they are, there are no holes. Uh, this is still an argument, but uh, the, the basic idea has been well expressed. If you are tolerant to this temperature and to another temperature, you should also be tolerant to the temperature in between. And that is convexity. And ellipsoids are convex things. And complicated models that, that some people um, promote, those that fit overfit the data, maybe produce holes. And holes are not good models for, for fundamental niches. And to be clear, Maxent models can have those holes. Maxent being the most popular algorithm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions you guys want to address? There was one that I just uh, lost. Let me find it, please. Something that if I don't find it, but it said something like, like if the fundamental niche could have more than one, one uh, centroid or, or it's 20, 29, 11. Thank you. I was going to suggest the same question. I was looking at it. <laughs> okay. And the fundamental niche have more than one centroid. Go for it, Mona. Well, not if it's convex. No, I was going to, to ask for your, <laughs> your opinion, Enrique and Horman. Not, 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 I wasn't going to answer it. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Well, I, I think there are local, local optima. That, uh, local adaptation may have high fitness values at different environmental conditions, probably not, not, uh, not all the same height, but uh, it's, it's more like, uh, it's, it's something like, like the adaptive la landscapes in, in genetics. But that, that would imply multiple fundamental niches. No, 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 no. You said local that, adaptation. Yes, but yeah. not, that doesn't mean multiple fundamental niches. That means, that means a, a more complex internal structure of one fundamental niche. Hmm. Yeah, I think Enrique is perfectly right. And you and I town published a paper on the shape of the fundamental niche an extremely important and interesting paper they <laughs> were into. Uh, and in that paper, we mentioned under what circumstances there may be um, two or three centroids, a humpy fundamental niche. I, I suspect it happens uh, for certain species, mostly what Enrique described. 
if you have a very wide range of distribution of a single species, you would expect local adaptations. Ah, but local adaptation is essentially different subsets of the species shifting their niche in a particular direction. So that's why I said multiple niches. Well, it becomes then a semantic thing. A species has a niche or populations have a niche. It's, um, it becomes semantic. If we define the niche of a property of the species, then the niche has homes. If we define the niche of property of the populations, then each one has its own centroid and it, it's so, a matter of choice. Well, I, will, I would use the, it's probably an aged concept, but the idea of deem, which is to say a subset of the species range within which you essentially have effectively random mating. And that, that creates a single niche. That creates what? A single niche for the entire species. Yes. Uh, and I think it's important to make that assumption or to establish that assumption at the beginning because the methods we use, at least in correlative niche models, they don't allow us to consider for these kind of complications. If you assume the niche can be multimodal, you don't know what mod it corresponds to what population and whether that projection of that niche is going to be valid for all populations. So you, you, you cannot account for that. You cannot measure the niche of each population either, unless you have an historical record of the entire set of environments that that population has been facing. And also if there, if the extremes of those, uh, 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 conditions are actually in that place or in that historical record. So it's, it's, they are complications that are inside this kind of methods, like they, we cannot account for them. And the main assumption we do with, with when we are creating these models and making them explicitly convex with just one mode is that like the species can have an, an only, an only niche. Uh, but that's useful for some applications. Like if you're interested in local adaptation, you will have to use a different set of tools. Uh, and at least that's my perception. You have to look for other things. You have to actually uh, prove that there's local adaptation, which you cannot do only with climate, climatic variables. I don't necessarily agree on, on, on this. I, I think that we need, uh, to improve our tools to characterize the niches. And if, if the niches happen to, to be multimodal, because there, there is a wide niche with many populations of, of, of species, not disconnected, but, but uh, very low connected, uh, it's, it's a matter of how we characterize that. We have many examples. Yeah, the problem is that we don't know whether that's local adaptation or not until we test that uh, there is a like variation. There is there is a difference in the genetic pool in that population compared to others. No, but but if you because, fitness, some 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 fitness measure abundance, for example, and you you find similar levels of, of abundance or any other fitness under different conditions, why would you? Think that it's local adaptation because the way we measure the climatic conditions in those areas that's just a pixel of like minimum two one, one kilometer size and it's a it's a general measure of climate and we know that the species behavior plays a major role in whether the abundance of certain population is higher or not especially with like mammals and more and higher species you can have you can have even the same niche, but in some place that set of individuals have learned to certain behavior that allows them to grow more, to to pr reproduce more efficiently, and probably like biological interactions play another major role in that. So I think those complications make it difficult. I I do believe 
there is local adaptation. I just think testing it and proving it, it's complicated. Sure. Mona, you want to make a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna comment that if we, if the, if we think about this question, can the fundamental niche have more than one century from purely from like a geometry perspective, uh, we have some, some sort of volume shape, whatever we want to call it. And in that regard, there should be just one century for that particular shape. If we think about it from just the geometric, I don't know, perspective of the question. Um, but maybe the question was about what you are discussing, which is um, specific maxima <laughs> of suitability because of local adaptation or, or other, other um, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking local adaptation. But on the other hand, I was thinking, when I was reading this question, I was thinking, well, if we have a shape, a three-dimensional shape, in, you know, if you ask someone who studies geometry, can you have more than one century? Then I, I, I would think that the, que the answer would be no, there's just one century for any shape. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the shape is convex. Uh, convex shapes have one century. And, and there, there's another, another question related to this one. Yeah, and, it, and this is if, if the centroid is always the optimum, and I think it's not. I think sometimes the centroid is not the optimum because it depends that on, on the relationship with the environmental variables. I and mean, if they are not Gaussian, bell-shaped, the, the, the optimum is displaced from, from the centroid. That's what I think. May I make a general comment here? Please. So go, go a little bit sort of back from the question, this detailed question. There are basically two fields in this, uh, in this area of, of niche modeling. One which is very statistical and cares about whether data is well fitted and you can do predictions and do the, your AUC and all that. And there is another area where we engage in this kind of conversations and, and, and wonder about the shape of the fundamental niche and the, 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 the seven, several centers and so on. Uh, this second field is proposing a lot of interesting questions, whether, whereas the other is just one question, it fits the data or not, and that's it. Hmm. So there is value in doing this kind of uh, speculative discussion because new questions arise and new problems and new perspectives. Uh, so don't, don't think that it's just a waste of time uh, uh, wondering whether the fundamental niche has several centroids or not. Of course, the fundamental niche is a concept and therefore one would say, hey, these guys have been platonic. Why do we care? What we care is whether the data is well fitted or not. Well, to a degree, but once you, if you are of that school, the questions stop there almost. Whereas in the other side, well, how can we measure fundamental niches? What species are useful to do that? How can we do it? If we do it, are we going to find different centroids? If we have different centroids, what that means uh, and so on. You, you go further by <clears throat> having this kind of theoretical approach. I'm trying to justify my existence. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think well, so let's go even farther. If, go back to my three questions about, is there a relationship? Are the methods the right methods? And are the data sufficient? If that first question, the re if to that first question, the response is yes, then we have a really fascinating, fascinating linkage between the world of distributional ecology, biogeography, and this other world of population ecology. And that's, that's exciting because until Enrique kind of ignored Jorge's and my advice and pushed this, this idea forward, um, to be very honest, 
we were dealing with concepts that were that were kind of contradictory and they were disconnected let, let's say <laughs> no time we went to 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 hear your mother-in-law talking about <laughs> weather Until Towns come, comes back, they, they. No, I just we have a we have a birthday here, and it's a big birthday, so everybody's calling uh, first thing in the morning. And if you have many many children, then you have many many phone calls from your children. <laughs> but anyhow, I I think this is a really exciting step forward, simply because it links and integrates and unites different worlds of biology, different sub-disciplines. And so if that first question, the answer is yes, it's exciting. And we'll figure out the methods and we'll figure out the data and all that. The question is whether that relationship in truth exists. Now we're well over our hour, but I will um, wrap up by saying we've got to remove a little bit of the shine from Enrique because he, he got this idea he, with his first student when he went back to Mexico, he developed um, a first set of analyses, really neat stuff, and began presenting seminars about this <laughs> and Ivan de Val published the paper the first one yeah but but Enrique did it better right. yeah of course it was Enrique's idea years before but let's go even farther he took a year and two years and three years and four years at some point in there I said to him hey you know you need to publish this um, I've got some extra money on a grant. How about if I, if I, as a reward, how about if I buy you a nice new laptop? And he said, okay, deal. I'll have it done in a month. <laughs> After about six months, I, I gave him the laptop thinking that maybe that way he'd be able to finish the paper. About four years after that, <laughs> I ended up with Enrique's slides on my on my laptop because he presented it yet again. <laughs> and I decided I'm just not gonna sleep tonight. And I wrote the paper, gave it to him and said, just add this table and this figure and submit it. A year after that, obviously nothing submitted. Am I lying, Enrique? No, no, you're not. Okay. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> A year after that, finally, um, we spent a week eating very good beef, drinking a lot of beer, and writing in Brazil, and finally the paper came out, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. We, that's true. We've been uh, too kind to you, Enrique. There was too much admiration. But, but this... this uh... Give, give me some credit because I can, I can give a very good on procrastination. You see? At least you were persistent. You, you stuck with that same paper for almost a decade. So that is very, a very admirable characteristic. It was a decade, yes, that's right. I, down you're in trouble. I think your current students will ask for laptops and, and good meat and... <laughs> Uh, he wasn't my student when all of this happened. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> yeah, so they will they will stay sit on a on a manuscript until the laptop arrives and the <laughs> stakes. <laughs> but it, it doesn't work. Really, I tried really, really good manuscript, eh? <laughs> that's well that, that's a good story because it's something that happened to me it blocked my mind that that uh, idea that paper and i couldn't unblock my mind so yeah thank you town for for your help <laughs> i think 
any of us who has no papers that are more than a year behind in getting them done should not throw the first stone, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, it's a neat idea. <laughs> and, you know, my, my congratulations to Enrique essentially for posing an idea and assembling the evidence around it or at least initial evidence around it. But the idea is so interesting that it sparks now, what, a dozen papers that have been, been written pro or con, for, or against, <laughs> saying it's true, saying it's not. But that's a good idea, right? No. Bad ideas are the ones where you publish them a month after you gather the data and nobody ever reads it, nobody ever cites it, and nobody ever cares. It's a very active uh, debate right now. Yep, there was a paper published this week on um, abundant center questions in, I think it was coral reef fishes or something. Right, but that's geographic center. I know, it was geographic center, and it would be cool to ask those same questions with a niche center. Yeah, and there is another one with a G, shaped relationship and they make a lot of fuss about not being a linear relationship. Who cares whether it is linear or not? I mean, again, make the difference between the methods being right versus the concept. I think, I think the major challenge is like to test this idea. I, I sincerely don't believe it's, it's a grown idea. I think it's, it's true. But uh, testing it, it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's, I sincerely think it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, tested with uh, the data we use normally for ecological niche models. Uh, and the experimental design I was thinking once about uh, for testing this, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> your poster, it's, it's your little, Marlonarium works now, so <laughs> you can test it, Marlon. Yeah, I know. That's why I was thinking about it. No excuses. I'll buy you a beer for that one. <laughs> oh, no, a laptop. <laughs> Not a beer. laptop. A, beer. <laughs> a toy laptop. <laughs> My laptop okay. is old now. Can you do something for that? <laughs> Give our regards to your father-in-law. Yes. yes, I will. Indeed, it's his 90th birthday today. So. Today's a big day. Anyhow, um, everybody pay attention to Biodiversity Informatics, the journal, and you will see a special issue coming out in the next few weeks about, um, about exactly this topic. Um, and it should be interesting and lively as a discussion and debate. Um, thanks, Enrique Mona, Jorge Marlon for joining me uh, at two minutes to the hour when I remembered to send you guys the link. I was thinking, oh damn, I'm going to do this one alone. <laughs> but thanks for joining me. You have you, our back. We have your back. That's yes, it. you have my back, thank you. Um, next week, we start with Frontiers. So we'll have a talk by uh, Alexandre Diniz Filio kicking off um, kicking off a, a session on frontiers in ecological niche modeling. And then I think we have a talk from Jorge Laura. and Laura Jimenez. If the talk is there, the only thing that is missing is the recording, which we will do today, and you will have it. Great. And that will be about fitting biologically realistic response shapes when we want to model an ecological niche, which is to say that talk has the potential to take 31 weeks of advice that we've just given you and toss about 90% of it into the garbage. And I agree with it, which is to say, why would we model ecological niches by fitting response curves that don't look like ecological niches. Well, it's, 
it the fundamental you're modeling or is it realized that you're modeling? I care mostly about fundamental. Anyhow, everybody, no. tune in to Dinis Filio's um, overview and Laura's talk on fitting biologically realistic response curve. Okay? Thanks, okay. guys, and see you all next week. I will remember to send around the link earlier next week. I hope so. Bye. Bye.